Well, welcome to Black Genius. This is Lola Shion Bola, founder of NAR Press. I'm here with Lanre Aina, and he's the founder of Content Garage. So I'm going to give a proper introduction to Lanre, but first I want to know who's watching. Where are you? How are you feeling? I'm in Cambridge. It is 3.02 in Cambridge, England today. And, you know, the world is still ending and I'm here for watching all of it, <laughs> the ways, all the ways that the new world is, is going to come into being. Larry, how are you? You're in Lagos, right? I'm doing well in the sunny city of Lagos. The sunny city of Lagos. So as you as you would have seen in Lanre's bio, uh, he's the founder of Content Garage. And when I met Lanre, he was telling me about how he basically halved the cost of video production in Lagos and just attracted all this new business to himself and just kind of revolutionized the way people were making making commercial films and, and digital video productions in Lagos. Um, and before that, he was at Google for six years working in um, brand activations and you worked on YouTube Nigeria. So really great resume. And he's a Harambe. He's one of the founders of Harambe Entrepreneur Alliance, of which I'm super proud to be a member. Um, and, um, you know, he has some juicy, member. huh? Founding members. Founding yeah. member of Harambe. And he yes. was there. For, yeah. Remember, remember the 23rd of September is the 23rd or 24th. Were you there for that day? <laughs> Uh, I believe I was actually. <laughs> yes, Okendo was here. He told us the story. So Lanre has some juicy stories about the early days of Harambe, and he does a really great Okendo impression. So we, you have a lot to look forward to in today's episode. So okay, Lanre, you are in Lagos. Um, we were talking yesterday about how COVID has just kind of decimated business and changed everything. Talk about you know how the last like five months have been for you. I, th I think it's been crazy. Um, Crazy because uh, I don't think any anyone really expected expected this, um, and I remember the first the first time I heard about COVID was sometime in January, mm -hmm. and it just felt like something far away in Asia, right? And it felt sort mm -hmm. of like um, like the bird flu. You know, we hear about it will spread a little bit, but we'll never get here. And uh, by the time we got to early March, in fact, we heard about it. I was actually on um, I was on vacation between uh, late January and February. And we're on a boat somewhere in Dubai, myself and my wife and my kids. And we heard about it. So we were like eager to get off the boat because you know you don't want to have, have <laughs> you don't want to have, you know, an infection on, you know, on, on the boats. Uh, no so many people mind. got stuck at sea. Some of them are still stuck at sea. So many, yeah. so many people yeah. did. So, uh, so once we got off, we're like super happy, but we started to, you know, we started to get really, um, um, it started to get really um, um, sort of interesting the way it was spreading. Then, mm. uh, you know, then we decided to, you know, to start to pay more attention and, and all of a sudden it just got here and we're like, oh my God, what's going on? Um, wow. And by the end of March, it, you know, we had our first case in Nigeria and it looked like everybody started to say, look, you know, business can go on as usual, shut down. And the shutdown was like, oh, it'll just be two months and we'll be back to, you know, back to business. And, you know, over, I, I think over, it really started, shutdown started in April. By the time we got to late May, our, our revenue as a business had fallen by, you know anything between ninety three to ninety five percent? Lord, I'm telling you. So we're going into March, and we had like four clients who had already booked us to do work, right? Um, and some of them were big clients. Don't want to mention them, but you know, it felt like oh, March is going to be a good a good month, and we'll spill over mm. into April. And by the time mm. we got to the end of April, all those jobs were wiped out. Everyone mm. called and said, oh, you know, I don't think we should do this anymore. You know, we'll call you when things look good. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what happened. Uh, uh, so it was shocking. We had to close down the office. And I think for us, um, you know, being a production studio, it's a face-to-face -face thing. You have to be in contact with people. You have to come into their space. You have to come into their houses. You have to book out places. Sometimes you need fake crowds, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yes. And so, you know, uh, you have to go to studios, you know, um, with being a production company, you interact with people all the time. So for us, our business, you know, got as hit. I got in terms of the hit that we got was almost as bad as cinemas, right? Hmm. Uh, 
So that became our, our reality. It took us about two months to figure out, you know, how to adjust. Uh, but that's the new reality. So now as a production company, we're working from home. We're doing a lot of the pre-productions at home. Um, and the mm -hmm. clients who are sort of coming back and warming up, you know, are booking our services. But it's, um, I told my team, it's it's a different world, you know. And you, um, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, finish that thought, finish that thought. Oh, I just said it's a different world. And I don't think we'll get back to, to that normal. I think it's yes. a completely different world. Um, it's going to be a brand, a brand new world. And you, you were telling me how, I think it was March when we, when we first spoke and you were telling me how, um, you guys were going to start, you know, creating your own content, animated content, distribute that. So what is that still yeah. part of your strategy or how are you guys pivoting? Oh yeah, absolutely. So that's the, that's the natural pivot for us. So it's, um, uh, for the last three and a half years, we've sort of, We've existed as a services business, uh, which means there's no business without service. Mm. Uh, we apply our service to, to businesses, so we're sort of like a B2B business. Uh, so if Nestle co uh, comes calling, and, and we know they, they would, they'll probably do anything between you know, three to four medium-sized to big commercials a year. Facebook would do okay. the same, Google would do the okay. same, you know, MTN would do the same. So, you know, you play your game well. If you get 20% of those jobs, you know, through relationships and, and of course, meritocracy, then you know that it's a good year, right? Um, mm. But sometime last year, you know, which was kind of strange, sometime last year, June, I started to think different about the business. And I was like, you know, we've done well over the last three years, but I, I don't think this is the most efficient way to run this business, um, a content business. And I started to think about the pivot then, and the pivot for me was obvious. It was we needed to move from services uh, to what I call um, um, a product-based business, where you create something that you can sell over time mm -hmm. and sell and sell and resell again, uh, which was why we wanted to go into original content. You mm -hmm. know, um, so that was an idea we had you know, almost a year out, you know, and we started to work on it. We started to, um, you know, but just as, as, a, as a plan B, not even as a plan B, as a 20% what they call it, right? Mm -hmm. This is our main focus, but th that's our 20%, you know? So, um, so when COVID hit, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't, wasn't ground zero. It was just like, okay, well, we have this 20% that we can start focusing on, you know, and we started to do that. So that's what has sort of kept us running and operational um over the last three months in, in terms of just being active and mm -hmm. we're hoping that we can launch our first uh, couple of episodes you know by this august so uh, is this going to be the animated series the sports series no so this is actually going to be it's called signature moves okay, okay. <laughs> and basically what we want to do is we want to look at uh we're focusing on sports and we want to look at some of the um most iconic players uh that have graced africa Okay. And we're looking at some of the moves that they did, you know, um, you know that we remember. So JJ Okocha. Was it the Okocha? Yeah, you were telling me what was the name of the of yeah. the move, the Okocha move. So the JJ Okocha move is called the step over roll. Okay. <laughs> For anyone who okay. watches football or soccer inside, it, well, your side of the world, um, is uh, um, he he takes the ball, he does he he does a, a rollover with his right leg, and he does a step over with his uh, left leg. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an amazing move. Uh, the reason why we're excited about it is that if you go online, a lot of people actually think Cristiano Ronaldo is the inventor Invented. of the step over roll. Mm -hmm. And we are here to tell them that it's not Cristiano, that it's actually JJ. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, we have 35 different compilations of JJ from 1993 wow. right, wow. till 1998. And when did Ronaldo more, first... Where, first use the move look if ronaldo can show me a video where he did the move as a 10 year old then i i, I give him the move <laughs> because in 1993 ronaldo was about 10 i think so oh, if he can I show see. me a video where he did the move as a 10 year old then we give him the move but if he can't then jj jj owns the move uh so, so it's for those who don't know for those who don't know who jj okocha is can you talk a little bit about his career and what he means to nigerians and other okay so the jj world? okocha is hmm 
Now, I don't want to blaspheme, but J.J. Okocha is probably the Michael Jordan of Nigerian football. Either the Michael Jordan or the Magic Johnson, depending on you know how you how you see him. So he's probably the most flamboyant, most skilled um, African player that we've seen in a generation. Mm. Um, he's retired now, but if you go on, on YouTube and you search his name, you just find all sorts of amazing, you know, trickery and football. And um, and we want to pay him home, uh, homage by creating uh, amazing content that speaks to him. Um, I know him personally, you know, so I know that this would this would sort of catch him off guard, but um, I'm sure he would enjoy it. <laughs> you you told me some really juicy stories <laughs> about oh, when you first about, when you first about. met JJ or you know I I remember the story you were telling me about the Nigerian team when they went to Atlanta. Oh lord. How much of that how much of that are you allowed to share? <laughs> well, I can I can share a little bit. Um I mean, I'm super I wouldn't say I'm a historian like Okendo, but mm. you know, I History, I really love history. I, you know, I, I love nostalgia. You know, I go on YouTube and I look for like commercials from the 80s, like that. Mm. Thing. So Milo, uh, um, Planta, Butter. Mm. If you remember that? I don't know if you remember that. But I, I remember Planter. I mean, you know, I was, I was seven, last, you know, when I left Ninja Park. Um, but we ate Planters in, in Joy, the States, I think. Joy Girl. I'm not sure Say if you joy, 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 what? Joy um, oh no, joy I don't remember that. Okay, no, I don't remember joy. I'm uh, sure my mom. Omo. I'm sure my mom knows about it. Omo Super Blue Omo, watch his Friday and it shows. So all those different commercials, I'll go back and I'll watch. <laughs> like I'm telling you, they're there. They're online. They're amazing. Um, so that's me. So um, you know, so with Atlanta '96, I had an opportunity to actually sit down with the team. Uh, I believe it was about four years ago, three years ago, four. Um, and we met at JJ's uh, Club 10 then in, um, in Victoria Island. And I was just a fly on the wall. And I was listening to these guys talk about, sort of reflect on Atlanta 96. And the stories I was, I was hearing, I was like, whoa, guys. You know, <laughs> um, just, you know, a lot of corruption in, mm. in, in, the, in the football federation. You know, how a lot of times our leaders would bet against us. Mm. You know, even before we do anything, our own you know, presidents. You know, they were not going to win. Mm. Well, you know, uh, but not even as you know, not really at the president level. Now yeah. at the federation level, at the football federation level, sort of betting against the guy, saying that hey, this is, you know, we don't need a full budget because these guys are not going to even go far, right? So let's just give them half budget and let them go do figure out what <laughs> what it is, and we will use the remaining money for ourselves and our girlfriends mm. and our wives. You know, mm. because we also want to go to the Olympic Games. Mm. People, you're not running. You're not, you know, you're not doing anything. <laughs> you're spectators and you're taking half of the budget to go to the Olympic Games. And I thought it was fascinating. And I, and I asked them, I said, why, why have you guys uh, talked about this? And they were like, you guys never asked. And I was like, wow. You know, wow. which inspired me and uh, locked something in my head, locked something away. I was like, you know, one day I would, I would revisit this. Uh, but mm -hmm. such amazing guys. Uh, there was a lot of infighting. But it was really nice to actually see. It was it was sort of like healthy rivalry, you know, for lack of a of, of a of a better word. It was healthy rivalry, um, and all of them were in their prime. There was Ipeba mm -hmm. who was called the Prince of Monaco, you mm -hmm. know, because he played in AS, um, AS Monaco, I believe. Uh, there was JJ Culture who was you know just a you know, complete showman. There was Kanu who was coming from Ajax. And who was mm -hmm. an amazing whiz kid, you know. There was a uh, Munique, who I believe was in FC Barcelona at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, there was uh, Daniel Amokachi. There was Sunday Olise, who was the first um, Nigerian to break into the Italian league. I mean, it was just mm -hmm. such an amazing team. And 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 all of them, and the, the true representation of Nigeria, right? The Hausa people, the Igbo, there's Yoruba. You know, there's um, there's Efik, there's Ibibio, everybody playing together, everybody, and the entire country, if not the continent, behind these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it was massive, man. And for us to actually play Brazil and be 3-1 down and to experience all the craziness that we experienced, you know, in the game and to come back and win that game, I thought was, was massive. And I feel like, you know, a truly national um, sort of moment for all of us. Mm. You know, uh, it's something that you know. I, I believe that as a company, we would celebrate in our in our sort of way, you know, through content. 
but just as a fan, it was just it was a great experience just sitting there and, and listening, you know, mm. to this great talk. You know, I felt like uh, it felt like last dance before the last dance. Mm. <laughs> the original, yeah. the original last dance. The original, the original, the original. Talk a little bit about sports, it, you know, sports uh, media. And, yeah. and the opportunity on the continent that that was one of the most fascinating yeah I think I think sports is is massive well what do you think about sports and you know I like to be very pragmatic about the opportunities in sports and and I explain it by by saying who's the most popular Nollywood star and a lot of people mm-hmm. say oh, maybe Genevieve and I kind of agree I think she's um I think she's really worked her way to the top. I think she's big time she's box office she's easily our will Smith right mm. uh, box office Jenny. So um, I take Genevieve and I walk through the underground in London. A couple of people would know who we are, right? Jenny on my side. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to be a shutdown. Mm-hmm. But if I take mm-hmm. Kano Warnko and I take JJ Okocha, <laughs> that chain would be delayed. Mm-hmm. Right? That's what these guys have. And not only just in London, JJ has the same sort of swag in Turkey, mm. probably in Germany uh, and France, all those different countries where he played, you know, and, and Kanu might even be as big, if not bigger, mm. you know. Um, and and all we're saying is that the opportunities that sport presents is an opportunity for us to still tell a truly African story, a Nollywood story, but to switch out the actors. Mm. So instead of having mm. Jennifer, I just have JJ. Mm. That matters. So whether you're watching it as as live sports or you're watching it as non-live sports, it's still entertainment. Somewhere in our in our brain, we still it's entertainment, mm. right? It, it's the lawyers and the I, business managers, you know, that sort of that sort of parsing that say, well, this is sports entertainment and it's live, and that that's film and movies and that's cinema. Mm. Our brain is just entertainment. We get the same dopamine effect that we get from a like or from a, a retweet. Or from a YouTube video, a DIY video that we get from, you know, from watching movies and football. It's just it's not it's not more. I thought it would be more for sports. Maybe, it seems like maybe, the maybe, emotional. Maybe, maybe more, but what I'm just saying is, it's our bodies can figure out if it's if I just watched a vlog or a funny video mm-hmm. of football. It's just we watch something, we're distracted and we're entertained. You know, that's it. And I want you to understand that fundamental. Right, you're looking for opportunities where you can tell stories that would, you know, that would stick, and I think that's what sports presents. So when you think about the opportunities, 600 million people watch the African Nations Cup globally. The last one, 2019, I believe. Wow. That's massive. Thinking about all the people around the world that are interested in African sports, right? Mm-hmm. Then you now think about, in fact, just because I'm a bit of a, a nerd, I would do randomly. I'll do like a Google trend. Um, sort of comparison between the most popular artists right now in Nigeria, maybe like Burner Boy and David O, and I'll compare them with um, Chelsea. Mm. And every time, like you could do it yourself, just check the trend. Those guys combined don't match the interest in Chelsea FC. Mm. That told you something. You know, so that's what we see, you know, um, as an entrepreneur, as as a business, we see that we're like, you know, that's interesting. I want to tap into that. So talk about Signature Moves. Is that the name of the, the series you're about to launch? Yes. Yeah. Talk, so tell Signature us a little bit about that. Moves, we, um, <laughs> we, want to, we want to spotlight uh, mainly Africans. Okay. Um, and Africans could be Africans in diaspora, Africans by heritage, Africans who are local. And we, we, want to find, we want to find 12, or we already have 12 um, amazing stories that we want to develop. So one of that is JJ. Another is Kanu. Kanu has something called the, the overhead flick that he does. And that mm. was the move that sort of gave us the equalizer against Brazil, right? Um, I want to spotlight this guy that, that really interests me, um, Israel Adesoya, mm. who is, um, I think, the African king, or if not the king of MMA right now, mm. uh, with UFC. Uh, so you have all these different guys who are at the top of their careers, and we just want to we want to single out this move that nobody else does, or they do better than anyone. Anyway, that makes them who they are, and that allows us to almost create this sort of op-ed, you know, type uh, 
uh, type video without having an extensive documentary. It's like a mini doc, you know, but it's 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 almost done vice vice style or Vox style. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't take too much resource, but you know, it keeps you excited. Uh, there's actually a channel that I really like that does that, SB Nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, an American sports channel on YouTube, um, and I believe on TV. Uh, but it's just amazing, and and that's what we want to do. I want to do it also not just for the men, for the women. You know, that's important. And spread that love. Mm. Uh, so there are a couple of people that we sort of uh, we've uh, spotlighted. Um, there's a lady who plays Oshola, who plays in in Barcelona. I think she's a Nigerian player, oh. and she's really good. I think she's won best player in Africa, maybe back to back twice or three times. Wow. Uh, so again, so this is it. If BBC doesn't want to talk about us or CNN, we talk about us. Okay, <laughs> and, 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 I'm no shade to them, but you know, I'm I'm like, we you need to be talking about us every day. But I know that mm. your body, your body is tight because there are a lot of people that you want to talk about. So we talk about ourselves. No, we, we need to talk about ourselves every day. Nor press. We're getting there. That's that's the purpose of Nor yeah. Press. So Absolutely. So how did you come to, and the name of your company now is Atlas. Is that how it's pronounced? So Atlas is the company that is focused on sports. On the sports, um, yes. How did you come to, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so sorry, it was, it was if, if we go backwards, you, you have Atlas, is Content Garage still, are you, you guys still have projects for Content Garage, it's still active? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. For Content Garage, uh, um, again, the vision for Content Garage was to help small businesses and large businesses sort of tell amazing stories. Um, and to tell it, you know, with optimized cost, uh, low cost, um, high quality. And that's the vision. Um, and we still do that. But I think Atlas is slightly different. Uh, the mentality, as opposed to content, which is more of a, it's more of a small business. Atlas, the vision for it is a venture, right? Mm-hmm. So the way we've approached it is, you know, is, um, you know, uh, with that venture mentality. And Atlas would focus on sports and we focus on developing local content Meaning the guy who's jogging on the bo- on, on on the road in Enugu, who nobody wants to, you know, maybe someone recorded him on Instagram and that's it. We want to give him an immersive story, okay. you know, the backstory, everything, the whole mix, and be able to tell that between eleven and fourteen minutes, you know. Um, and we want to do that also for the star who, for example, JJ Okocha, we just know his videos on YouTube, but when mm-hmm. you talk about his personality, I don't think a lot of people you know, really know him, you know, like things he likes, you know, what makes him laugh, you know, mm-hmm. his family, you know, how he thinks about football, what he's doing right now as an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. all those different things. You know, in fact, people don't even understand, you know, the Okocha family, and, and this is just based on my relationship with them. JJ actually had an older brother, Emmanuel, who played in the national team, right? Just the most amazing guy ever, Emmanuel. Um, and Emmanuel used to play before JJ played. And Emmanuel has an older brother who no one knows, who is James, wow. right? And in wow. fact, James was the original JJ, right? So it was James, JJ, or Kocha. But there's a thing in Africa, and I think uh, particularly in Nigeria, if you have like a role of brothers, right? And it happened like where I grew up. Like if, you know, you a lot of times you have that family where they have like three boys or four boys and the first one is popular is like the popular guy in the community and he's played football and they call him they call him uh you know a, a dragon right so if his name is shego dragon or yewale mm. his name is dragon right all the brothers are going to be dragon so shego okay. dragon femi dragon okay. tunde dragon that's what, <laughs> thing. And that's what happened to your culture as so it was james jj then Ima JJ, then Austin JJ. Oh, wow. But, but it looked like the world just, you know, we didn't know Ima, we didn't know um, James because, you know, God bless them, there was no internet in their days. Mm. Um, <laughs> then JJ sort of became the popular one at his name stuff. Wow. So, I mean, I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited to see all the kind of content that you guys are going to produce. Uh, so definitely keep us posted on that so we can share it with our community. Yeah. Um, so before Content Garage, before Athletes, it was Content Garage and Content Garage is still active yeah. and before Content Garage, it was Google. And so what made you, you know, leave Google? Oh, Kendo's watching us now. Welcome, Chairman. <laughs> he says, aloha. <laughs> aloha. So we definitely got to get your Kendo impression in there. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do my Kendo question, don't worry. <laughs> but what made you leave Google? You were telling me about, you know, Harambe and, and yeah. entrepreneurship and how you felt like, yeah. you know, you wanted to do more. Yeah. So I think um, 
So going into, well, I think I, before, before I get to the Google story, uh, let me do a bit of a backstory, uh, being a storyteller. Um, so when I decided to move back to Nigeria, remember I'd already had the experience with, um, with Okendo and the, and, and, and the other guys um, in Harambe. My let's, life let's, let's, just, let's, let's just, you know, catch people up. So 20, 2008 yeah. recession, you graduate into the recession, you can't yeah. work for a year, you don't get any, your, your, your offers were pulled, <laughs> four yeah. offers off the table. Your and then the table. you told your parents the you're going to go, go off with this crazy guy named Okendo and help Okendo. him build Africa's future. Absolutely. So let me let me even do that. So let me let me let me start from there, and I quickly go into the Google story. So, and I wouldn't forget because you know you graduate well, and, and it's the Nigerian thing, right? You find the right school, you find the right course, and it's uh, you take off from there. Mm-hmm. You know that's how it is. Your parents the forget, they forget you, and they say we've done our best, we paid tuition, you know, <laughs> go 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 win, so, go forth and conquer, <laughs> go conquer. So. Um, so we, uh, I mean, we graduated and um, I was interviewing Fidelity Investment. I remember American Airlines, they had this uh, a sort of like a tech program or whatever. Um, and all these offers were really good. And, you know, I think the interviews I done maybe two, three of, um, you know, three per, per company. And I remember they just called back and just said, you know, we have to put a freeze because of what's going on in the economy. And I thought it was like the most painful thing. Like if I interviewed a month, month before, I would have, mm-hmm. I would have got him in there, mm-hmm. and um, and I remember my parents were asking, so they were like, what, "What are you going to do now?" And I like, you know, I was like, you know, I really want to be here. Like, you know, this is the dream, right? This is this is America, so I want to be mm-hmm. here. Uh, mm-hmm. So I will wait it out for another year, maybe a year and a half, and I'll see how that goes. Uh, but if they don't mind, I met this crazy guy called Okendo Lewis Gale, and. <laughs> <laughs> And he's selling me this dream on a piece of paper. That looks, that looks really good. So I was like, look, while I'm waiting, can I do this? Like, you know, you know, and, and it was something I wanted to get the family's permission on because I know that I'll be as broke as anything <laughs> coming here and I'll need help every now and then. So, you know, look, my mom was like, look, you know, it looks like it's something that you're passionate about, blah, blah, blah. You know, go do it. Mm. You know, so that's how we... That's how um, I jumped in and, you know, just, uh, you know, almost full time really um, and helped out. It was, it was a fantastic experience. I tell everyone, including the guys that work with me now, best experience of my life, oh, right? Yeah. Um, and I tell them from the experience of, um, you know, when you think about resources, when you think about life, um, it's always highs and lows, right? And you have to know when you're on a high and you have to know when you're on a low. Mm-hmm. And the lows are as important as the highs. And the way I explain it is follow. There's seed time and there's follow, right? Mm-hmm. And follow basically is, and I know this because my dad is a professor of Greek, right? So you mm-hmm. plant the seed, you know, the seed becomes corn, you know, you sort of till the ground, you do all that stuff. You really work the ground. You, you take out all the nutrients. But you need, as a good farmer, you need to put that, that uh, piece of land back into follow to sort of mm-hmm. get nutrients back and get ready for the next um and sometimes the strategy for follow is like you you plant um, um, uh, what you plant uh, things like le- le- legumes and beans and, and all that because you put nitrogen back into the ground. You don't know wow. that. Don't you? Oh, <laughs> so, I want to take a class with your father. Can we bring your father on? The- <laughs> I have to so, become a farmer. So yeah, so the same analogy, right? So follow, right? You have to know. So for me, I think Harambe. Once I graduated. I immediately saw Harambe as sort of like this fallow period. So things will not look good. You might be slightly broke. You know, you might be saying, hey, hook me up, guys. You know, you might you might have to lean on people. But the experience is almost as important as when you're out of that fallow. And, and that's how I embraced it. You know, so like I was telling you, I said, even with the COVID, I was like, the COVID can be as bad as 2008. 2000, I'm telling you. And, and, I, and I, I really don't mean any disrespect to anyone who's sort of lost people and things like that. And I get that. It, it's serious. But for me, it, you know, 2008 for me was like, whoa, mm-hmm. what is it? That was everything, the first time. Everything, no matter how well I spoke, how smart I sounded, it was just a closed door. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, but you're really good. Sorry. I thought you, oh, we thought, sorry. You should have come a month before. Sorry. 
and mm-hmm. it was that, you know. Uh, so Keno actually thought that, oh, Larry was so passionate about Harambe, he decided to do it here. No, I just had a lot of closed doors. <laughs> and Harambe was my father. <laughs> so. but, it was, but it was a great experience. Learned a lot. Greatest mm-hmm. experience of my life. Uh, because like I was telling you, you, and I think this was something that Okendo saw. He says, look, you guys are, you know, we've gone, we've, we've scoured around the United States for some of the smartest African students in school. Mm-hmm. So we're not giving you smartness, mm-hmm. right? You're already smart. You guys are, you know, you guys are in MIT and Harvard, you're in all these different schools, you're smart. But what we're doing is that we're building a community that gives you the confidence to say that now is our time and we can and go take it. And I and I really feel like, you know, sometimes Africans, we shy away from that spotlight. We're like, oh, is it really now? Should we really go? Should Africa develop? You know, I don't know. What are, what are our friends in Europe saying? No. Mm. Like, that's what the Harambe Endeavor is really about. Like, you can do it. And there are people mm. around that will celebrate you while you're doing it. And there are people around that would help you while you're doing it. And that's, and, mm. and that's important. So going back to Africa, going back to Nigeria, I was like, I'm already baptized. I've been to the mountaintop. <laughs> I've been to the mountain top. There's nothing. In fact, this is why I have to go back to Lagos. And I remember I got home. I called my dad, and I remember I got home October first, twenty ten. Hmm. Independence Day. That's when I walked through the year. Hmm. And I called my dad like a month before, and I say, "Hey, I just made my mind. I don't think I should stay here anymore. You know, I need to come to Lagos. You know, to come change the world." And, um, and, um, and my dad says something funny. He says, oh, yes, yeah, you can come change the world after you've paid back my $60,000 in tuition. Oh, <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> shots fired, man. Shots oh, yeah, yeah, fired. So I don't pay the world. I pay the tuition. I tell you when you come change the world. So I'm like, look, I will wow. come to the airport. If you guys don't want to pick me up, it's fine. I'll forgive you. <laughs> So anyway, so I came down and um, unfortunately for me, I, I interviewed for Google. Google was just expanding. I think there was just one person in the office, Lola Masha. So I was the second wow. employee at Google in Nigeria. Wow. And, um, and I liked it because it had this entrepreneurial feel to it. So it didn't feel like Google, you know, the US. It felt like, mm-hmm. oh, this it feels like a startup. We're in this almost 10 by 10 room you know, um, in Ikoyi. And, and by the time I was graduating, we were maybe over 25. By the time I was leaving Google in 2016, we were about, you know, maybe 20, uh, 25, thereabout. Wow. So the expansion, I mean, it was, it was nice to see. And, um, and the projects were just, they were just coming in. And, you know, it felt like, you felt like an entrepreneur because everyone depended on you to figure out what works for your market, right? Mm-hmm. And you make that case and you have to you know you have to go work it out uh so were you so a great experience. A market yeah uh yes yeah, so I, I my focus was uh was nigeria and there were a couple of there were a couple of products and i think google was also trying you to meant like Africa. a stream within, so there were a couple within of projects in the nigerian population Oh no no no! Just uh, just the general population, right? Okay. Uh, and okay. the, and there were different uh, the different projects targeted at different things. So they had the university programs was targeted at students. Then they had uh, the experimental with a few projects. I think my first project was something called Google Trader, that wasn't mm-hmm. in any part of the world except Nigeria. And they're trying to mm-hmm. test out the market and see if it was something that we could really respond to. Wow. That was a great experience. Talk uh, about then Google we, Trader. Then we had, uh, Google Trader. Um, Google Trader was a classified uh, platform, mm. very similar to Mocality. In the US, it, it would be, uh, what's the popular like one? It would be Craigslist. Yeah. It would be Craigslist, yeah. Mm. So they wanted to try that out. And, I, and it was a great strategy because it was an opportunity for us to sort of get, you know, um, relevant interaction on our platforms. Getting small businesses to register their businesses and start to use search you know in a slightly different way and and mm. stuff like that but i think down the line um you know google decided to stop it because it felt like we're competing against some of the local companies and there was no point because we're already providing them search we already were already making them better through our search okay. why would we you know um 
you know, sort of go around and compete against them. So I, I felt that it, it sort of uh, conflicted with what we're trying to do in the ecosystem. But I liked, I liked the idea, you know, where you're in a company where, you know, you could start something and, and stop and, and quickly I trade and pivot and find something else that made mm-hmm. sense. You know, so after that, I think I moved to YouTube and YouTube was quite interesting because a lot of people didn't really believe in YouTube um, as a platform in Nigeria because of the latency, you know, mm. of, 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 the, of the internet. Uh, but there was another strange guy that came into town. Um, and I say strange because it reminds me of a Kendo also. Um, his name is Jason Injoku. Oh. And Jason, Jason was a UK, uh, is a UK born Nigerian, I believe, uh, but spent most of his life in the UK, then moved back and literally went to stay in um, Alaba market, which is one of the roughest, you know, sort of markets, uh, busiest markets in, in Lagos. And this uh, British accent speaking dude sits in Alaba and he's digitizing DVDs. Mm-hmm. And literally built a business off Nollywood uh, of films. Of course, paying the producers and and sort of collecting, you know, the rights to put it online, and mm-hmm. quickly grew his business. So Jason opened up our eyes to the opportunities of YouTube because, um, mm-hmm. in part, because he made a million dollars on YouTube in his first year without monetization in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. So his agreement was with. Uh, um, YouTube partnership in Europe, but he brought that agreement to Nigeria. And immediately we saw that, we're like, what are we waiting for? Right, someone mm-hmm. just made a million dollars to open up that platform. So it was my job as the business uh, development uh, a dude in Google then to, to start to build the partnerships and, and uh, create the monetization opportunities. So that was really fun. Um, again, the vibe felt like what I wanted to do, right? That, mm-hmm. you know, that not restricted to a table you know, account manager somewhere, and no one knows about you, but they have that. Solve problems. Yeah. It, yeah. You're really solving problems and you saw it. You saw a million dollars in someone's pocket. You saw traders being able to put their business online. You saw people's mm-hmm. lives change, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that was, that was why Google was very interesting. But I think when I got to my fifth year or uh, fifth, going into the sixth year, I was like, uh, you know, I want to do stuff. I want to do more stuff. Um, and I always told myself, I even remember the interview that I'll spend five years and after that, I'll figure out what I want to do. Mm. Um, I, told, I remember telling Lola that my manager, like, you know, I'll, you know, what's your plan? Well, five years, I want to do this, then I'll figure it, you know, then I'll figure out. So once I hit the fifth year, I was like, it was about time. But again, my yardstick were my people, Harambe. Mm. You know, mm. what are people doing? Okendo had completely transformed this um, organization. Jonas was doing mm. his thing, you know, mm. um, all these different people, Halima, you know, um, I'm trying to remember the lady uh, from Cameroon. Um, all these guys were just doing amazing stuff, you know, whether for non-profit or for-profit, all those different, and I was like, look, you know, those are my people, this is what I'm going to do. So, um, you know, once I came out of Google, I was clear about, you know, wanting to start a business, uh, get my get my hands dirty, get my feet wet, mm. you know, and that's how we, we started Content Guard. How did you decide on what your business would be? How did that, did you have, was there a light bulb moment? Like, you know, how did yeah. you know, like, okay, this is what I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to do. Yeah. I think because by virtue of my, by virtue of my work at Google brand activation, I was always interfacing with the large brands. And when we go for those trainings and when, when we go for the interaction, interactive sessions, you know, I'm talking to like an MTN or a Samsung, and I'm like, oh, you guys should do more video. And they're like, video is expensive. And I didn't mm. understand it. What do you mean video is expensive? Like, you know, like, you have to, like, that's what people are reacting to right now. People mm. want to see video. People want to see, you know, people want to see all these very smart way, ways of, um, of communicating. And they were like, it's expensive. But I, I, I quickly understood why. And I understood why because... Um, um, a lot of those businesses have like huge agencies around them, right? So publicists, insight. So, you know, by the time you commission a video, it goes through this whole process, red tape, all that stuff, mm. multiple account management, the big problem, mm. <laughs> you know? And before you get the video out, the conversation you want to have, it's over, mm. you know? 
trends are like within days, seven mm. days, five days, then mm. over onto the next. So they couldn't keep but up. They have to be faster. I that, so I felt that I wanted to. So you either had that, the guys who were creating amazing videos, you know, like almost like film, music video type quality. And you had the regular videographers who were like just point and shoot guys. Who, oh, you know, I'm getting married. Come on, cover me. <laughs> oh, I'm doing this. Come on, cover me, you know. So it was that. And there was no in between, I felt. And I felt like, look, mm. we can be that in between where we could give you the quality of um, of the high end video or the mm. high end um, agency. But on this end, we can give you sort of like the speed and, and the flexibility of. And that's what I felt like content guys could do. So immediately I was leaving and I saw all those knees. You know, I just left and I just <laughs> I just went back to uh, <laughs> uh Yeah, that meeting we had two weeks ago. Um, I'm free now, so we could talk. <laughs> you know, and that's what happened. So you told me about a commercial <laughs> that you worked on for Mother's Day. Which which brand was it? So this was Bailey's. Uh, Bailey's, Bailey's is a brand. Uh, it's a brand under Diageo. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's really targeted at the women. Uh, it's um, so it's, um, it's a feminine audience, uh, probably between twenty five and maybe forty. And um, and these were early days. So Bailey's called us because we had done we had done some work for for Nestle. So we had done some work for Maggie. And someone on the Diageo team saw the video and asked me for the price. Uh, how much did it cost? Mm-hmm. And I said, Oh, it cost me. And the person, the person couldn't believe it. So the person takes the video and runs directly to the agent and say, oh my God, there's this guy who's doing this stuff for this price. Unbelievable. The guy doesn't mm-hmm. even know what he's using. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's how challenging. You know, so Bailey saw that. So Bailey's immediately called me into this media and then I'll say, hey, you know, we hear that you're the cheap guy. I said, I'm not the cheap guy. I'm the high quality, low cost guy. Wow. <laughs> it's two different things. Wow. <laughs> so, um, so they're like, okay, well, can you help us? And, and for me, I just wanted to do something entirely new. So I said, what are you guys thinking about? Since well, we have no clue about what we want, but we want it to be emotive, want people to cry, want people to just really feel like, oh, Bailey, mm. we love you. Mm. I think about it. Fortunately for them, I was reading a lot of uh, psychoanalysis books then. I don't know why. It was just that period. And I was like, ah. I said, you know what? Can we do a social experiment? They're like, what's that? I said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to shoot the video live. We're going to use real people, right? But we're going to bring in a a, um, a psychologist or maybe it's a, is it a psychologist or a psycho, probably psychotherapist. I think. I think mm. A psychotherapist, I think it is, okay. right? Because we need her to break the crowd, to break okay. the audience, right? Um, I, I wanted it to be live. I didn't want it to be scripted. I don't want actors. I want live stuff. So they were like, how are we going to do that? So I, I, told, I told them I would do this commercial if you can get me um, a, um, a therapist, right? Someone who can, you know, and I would put myself on the line. And if they break me, then that's our, <laughs> then that's our <laughs> actor. So they had two people and they bring this one, one girl who just moved back from the UK, Amanda. Mm. Oh my God. In two minutes, in two minutes, I'm like, you know, I needed to, I needed to block her off because ah, this madam <laughs> wants to get into. Me. He's going to pull out all my stuff, which is, chambers. which is no, perfect. After we talk about this, so this car- commercial, we're gonna talk about your your childhood, so it's perfect. Yes, but yes, perfect. talk about it. She's breaking all my walls. I'm like, so I look at the babies. People are like, she's the one. No. No more experiment. We're good. Like I, I will go with her. <sighs> so the the idea basically was, um, and it was just a very simple premise. And I think it was really from my own experience. You know, um, I'm very close to my mom, very very close to my mom, and but I feel like I take that for granted a lot of times. You know, like I never just call random like, "Hey, mom, what are you doing? I love you." You know, my calls are usually. Or were usually, um, oh, I saw you called me twice, so I'm calling back. <laughs> you know, um, and when I thought about it at Mother's Day, mm-hmm. I was like, look, can we do something that really shows that we love, 
you know, that we really love our mothers. And that was the idea. Aww. So we invited people and we invited their mothers, right? But they didn't know that their mothers were actually watching them while they were being interviewed by this uh, therapist. You know, so they were saying things that they'll never tell their mom, good things. You know, so their mom, you know, they're off camera, we're recording them also. And some of the moms were like, wow, I've never heard that from her. You know, and some would say, you know, we fight a lot, but I really love her. But I'll tell her, you know, I'll tell her and all that. So we just recorded and all that. But Amanda was so good that by the time we brought the moms, <laughs> Tissue was flowing. Everybody was, <laughs> like everybody to, was crying. Everyone was crying and, crying and we had to say, please, can we get more tissue? Can we? You know, it was, it was amazing. And we recorded everything. And I think the babies people were just like, wow, this is like crazy. And I was like, look, this is what we, this is what fans and, and customers really want. Like emotive mm. stuff, messages that really tough. I have nothing to do with the production. In fact, I think Bailey's was probably, if I read all the production we've done in the last three years, Bailey's was probably like at the bottom in terms of quality mm-hmm. and everything, right? But the message was powerful. And I was telling someone, I said, that probably was my best commercial because like when I looked at the post on Facebook, when Bailey's put it out, they had about 700,000 views in a week. But it wasn't mm-hmm. even that. It was 7,000 reshares. Mm. That's huge. Every thousand reshares on Facebook. You have you have to know Mark Zuckerberg for you to get that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what and that and I think that really solidified what we wanted to do, right? Mm. You can call all the commercial, um, you know, agencies and, and and production companies fine, but this is our lane. This is what we do, you know, and, and that mm. um, that became sort of like a springboard to do more stuff. Wow. So yeah. you said you're very close to your mom. When you know, when we were talking yesterday, you were telling me how you grew up playing in the yeah. grass and you played basketball in high school. And I was like, what American city is this guy talking about? But yeah. very soon it was clear that, you know, you grew up in Ife. You said your parents were both professors. We've talked about your father's agricultural expertise. Yeah. Um, and your mom was a, is a sociologist. They're both still teaching, yeah. right? So, uh, so talk about dad, okay. Your dad retired recently. My dad retired uh, two years ago, I think. Yeah. Okay. Now I was yeah. just going to ask you to talk about um, OAU, Ileife, growing up there, yeah. and you know how that sort of shaped your trajectory. So, um, uh, so I'm I'm born into this academic <laughs> sort of family, right? So my dad is a professor, my mom is a professor, and that's all we've known. Right, we grew up in Ife. Ife is a small town. Um, trying to think about an American city. So my dad, my my dad actually lectured uh, once, and we were with him um, in California at UC Davis. And UC Davis felt like Ife. I remember as a child, but UC Davis is completely different now because I was there <laughs> a few mm-hmm. few years back. I was like, wow, this is not Davis. This is a huge city. When we were there in eighty four, eighty five, eighty six, I believe. Um, UC Davis was like a real small, you know, sort of, um, Davis itself was a small mm-hmm. town. Um, mm-hmm. So it felt very country. Uh, I remember telling you that I never saw a fence. Like we never had a until I got to Lagos, right? Because mm-hmm. I just did, you know, I grew up in a place where, you know, you could see your neighbor's compound. It was just divided by flowers, beautiful flowers and hedges. And, and that was mm-hmm. it. Like, you know, so it was a very different part of Nigeria. Um, then Ife is known or was known as the most beautiful campus in Africa, right? So, um, you know, amazing roads, uh, amazing stuff, uh, flowers, trees, fruits, all sorts of things were going on. Um, you knew everyone and everyone knew you and it was a huge mm-hmm. community. So, I don't know, maybe about, you know, maybe about two to 5,000 families, maybe. Mm. Um, and it was just fantastic. And everything was huge. So if it was Christmas party, it's huge. Everyone comes. Mm. Even if it's birthday party, everyone comes. Everybody knows you. So there's no like, oh, we just invite the neighbors. No, everyone is mm. like, wow. you know, so, that, so that's how it was, basically. Um, and, um, and we grew up, we sort of grew up in that space. And uh, like I was saying, I said, you know, we had encyclopedias, libraries, books, just things around us that just showed us that we're an academic, uh, sort of like academic. You said your parents, your parents were on the computer from morning to night 
in the eighties. Yeah, they were well ahead in the early nineties, yeah, <laughs> I mean, well uh, okay. where you know we could afford uh, personal computers. You know, the, w working overnight was is like culture. Like, yeah, you want to work mm -hmm. hard. You know, <laughs> on all night, night eh? Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a big deal. I wake up in mm -hmm. the night, and my dad is working. My mom's working. Um, mm -hmm. Then you know, so again, so I have a, I have a, an older sister, and a younger brother, so that didn't help. You're the middle child. Middle child, but not only that, my my older sister was a whiz or is a whiz. So. <laughs> So she set the bar. She set the bar so high. So the bar was high. So it's always you always you know Bissola did that. How far were you? <laughs> Does Bissola have two heads? <laughs> you know. And um, I remember a story. I didn't know how I remember this, but I remember as a child that my my sister was explaining what the elephant bird was to my dad. Mm. You know, and she probably was maybe eight or nine or thereabout. And I was like, wait, I remember is that fiction? Because what is that? Because <laughs> later on, I found out, oh, the elephant birds actually existed. It just went extinct. Mm. You know? and so that was what I was competing against, basically. And, and I think because of that, and um, also growing up, you know, having, um, having asthma, um, there was also that sort of, um, there was a protective care, right? You can't do this. You can't run on fresh grass. You can't eat that. You can't do this. Mm. And I think I just found I just generally feel like, nah, I'm tired of you can't, you can't, I need to do. <laughs> so mm -hmm. once I went to boarding school, for high school, I, I did everything. I wanted to play basketball, I wanted to sing, I wanted to dance, I wanted to. I wanted and you, to decided, you decided to become a musician at one point. Oh yes, going into my first year in school, my first year in college, um, we had an EP, four tapes, that'd be four. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> It was the funniest thing and you, ever. you drove to where did you where did you have this uh, EP recorded? Went to Ibadan to go record. First time in Ibadan, public transport, coming from a small town Ife, where things Freak, are, freaked yeah. your parents out or your mom out at least. Yes. Once once my once my parents figured out that's what I was I was trying to get involved in, they were like, no more. <laughs> Done. So, you know. So how did they did they managed to corral you back around or how did you kind of move from music into well, I think it was it was more of um you know uh my parents are my parents are very they're very friendly very um they're your friends first before parents if you understand what I mean mm -hmm. so they'll allow you to you know to experiment you know to do to do what you need to do uh, but very quickly, if you're going off off the rail, they'll let you know their parents. So, um, and I think it was clear. I think it didn't make sense. You know, I was just in my first year in school, and mm. I wanted to be a musician. It did. It, it just didn't make sense. But it was just what I wanted to do. And my parents were like, "Hell no!" <laughs> <laughs> in this house, we read. <laughs> we don't see. We read. So then. <laughs> So then how did you how did you make your choice for what you know what the the real degree would be in? No, 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 no. I didn't even make my choice. So my parents literally removed me. No, I'm from, okay. Did they select your major for you? Uh no, no, no. So I, I knew what I what I wanted to do. So I was great in sciences. So I wanted to do either electronics, um, uh, electrical electronics or computer. I mean it was it was that. And uh, mm. as you would know, Lolade. That uh, once you have a doctor in the house, what's the next person? You have Everybody, you, a doctor, lawyer, something, lawyer, engineer, uh, pharmacy. You know the Nigerian mm -hmm, family. So my, mm -hmm. my older sister, she's a doctor. I had to be the engineer. My brother, I, I think, when I was going into school, they thought he'd be a pharmacist. You know, ended ended up uh, doing computer science, uh, computer mm -hmm. engineering. Uh, but that's how it was. So my parents literally said, "Look, we'll change school because it mm -hmm. looks like you're being distracted here." You know, so they moved me out. Uh, started school in a different college, and and I think that really humbled me because I like whoa, mm. not the year. Then I went to that college and I was really humble. Like it was the funniest thing. I remember my first semester <laughs> in that school. There were people who knew me from Ife and they knew I played basketball. Mm. So when I went to this new school, I wouldn't even step on the court, and people oh. didn't understand. They'd be like, "What? What? What's going?" On? I said, "Look, guys, I'm here to eat. <laughs> oh. This is a huge curfew for me." I mean, mm. only for, for the next three years. So. <laughs> but I mean, um, you know, I things worked out. Things worked mm. out. But it was, it was, um, 
it was a great experience, you know, it was a great experience uh, for me. Uh, but, you know, I would never have it any other way. You know, having parents that can make sure that you don't fall off the rails while, while you don't know enough about life. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that was important. Your parents sound pretty magical. They sound pretty awesome. They are. We have, to, we yeah. have to. We have to learn more about them. And you know, I I want to start some farms in in Niger and other parts of West Africa. So I'm serious about the agricultural thing. Okay, good. So I, I let, let's you. go ahead. Oh, I said I got you. I appreciate it. Right so there. we're gonna wrap up a little in a in a little bit, and I want to yeah. just kind of touch on you know, there's a question I ask everybody about about liberation, and clearly as a Harambian. And yeah. um, you've thought about, you know, a vision for the continent. Yeah. What what does African liberation, black liberation, what does it look like? How closely do you pay, you know, attention to the things that are happening in the States with George Floyd? What is what do you kind of dream of for the future of Africa? Um so I've had the opportunity to I don't even know if I'm a hybrid, um, and, and I and I mean that from the standpoint of I've experienced America. I've spent I've spent enough time to know what the culture is like and, and the people, and you know I'm also I'm also a Nigerian. Um, I, I, look, the George Floyd thing. I <laughs> unless you're not human. Mm -hmm, you know, but mm -hmm. that's not, not to get to you. I have my reservations about how I felt that we we reacted as Africans. And if you think back and you sort of go back, you know, um, a few weeks, a few months after his death, you know, people were marching in Australia. People were marching mm -hmm. in, in the UK. Asian people were marching. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any videos of Africans marching. Mm. You know, we sort of talked on Twitter, but I was like, look, people, what those people are going through is as important as what we are going through. Mm. And, and I know there's always a rivalry and there was a sense of that in the U.S., but I never really felt it. I had, had an African-American roommate, Emmanuel, amazing guy. You know, um, so I just, I just never saw it. But friends of mine would say, "Oh, there's, you know, there's a bit of tension between African Americans and Africans." I never really saw, saw it, personal experience. But I'm like, these guys are an extension of us, mm. right? Um, when we do well, they do well. When mm. they do well, we do well. Mm. <laughs> you know, and I've seen it a lot of times. I, I met with Debanji's manager. She's uh, Trish. Um, she's African American. And she's as Nigerian as it comes. Mm -hmm. and, and she's taking the band around the world. You know, a lot of the collaborations happening right now, you know, sort of the emergence of African music, apart from the fact that it's, it's great music, it's been great for a while. We've mm -hmm. had Sonia Ade and Ebenezer Obe, and we've had all these great guys, Sonia Okosu, Majek Fashek. Well, you see, what is different with this generation is that there's cross-pollination. There's, mm. help There's a helping hand between those cultures. Mm. Just executive produced Burner Boys um, album. Like that's that's why everyone is important to us. Like mm -hmm. everyone, you know, the African American cause is as, as important as ours. And it's unfortunate that we don't we don't necessarily embrace it in this generation because our our, our forefathers did in Kuruma. Mm. And and um, and Malcolm X mm. and Awolo and 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 Jomo Kenyatta, those guys saw eye to eye. Those guys, you know, understood sort of this, you know, you know, emancipation, this new thinking, and we sort of lost it in the seventies, mm. you know, and the eighties. Um, so that was shocking for me, and I don't have an answer for you. It's not like I marched, but I wish we could march. I wish, you know. You know, CNN could have picked Nigerians also saying, you know, George Floyd and taking a knee and all that. But for us, it wasn't important. It was like, oh, what are we going to eat now? Like, okay, what's mm -hmm. happening? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so when I think about it, that's how I think about it, you know. Um, and I want the African-Americans to succeed because when they do, we succeed. And when we succeed, they succeed. We, when, when we succeed, they succeed because they have an opportunity to come home. You know, mm -hmm. if you come to Ghana, they can start businesses in Nigeria. 
and even you know, and no one has to say, "Oh, they're black." Mm. We're all black. Mm. <laughs> and and I think and I think the more that we push that, and I think that's what Harambe is, you know, in 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 sort of like a, you know, in an early stage where we're cross pollinating sort of the culture and the ideas you know, mm-hmm. from the West and, and sort of bringing it home and collaborating and, and not saying that home is worse, you know, but saying that home has some good and we have some good. And if we bring this good together, then all of us can rise, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and, and that has to be the future. That's how we have to approach it. That's what I call, you know, that's blackness. That's oneness. That's what we, that's what I, I think would should. That's what I think should be ideal, you know, mm-hmm. um, Mm-hmm. That should happen in the ideal world, and it's happening. It's happening through entertainment now. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen mm-hmm. through sports. You know, it's going to happen through all the soft sort of um, spaces. Um, it's already happening, even through you know VC funding and and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and very soon it'll start to happen with leadership. And I think I I think that it's so critical. You know, and I also believe that you know while we think about that, we cannot act in isolation from mm-hmm. any other culture. The world is so interwoven and intermingled. Like, we we need everybody. I remember when mm-hmm. Okendo said he was going to China for a year, it was like, China? Dude, what are you doing? <laughs> but when he came back, we understood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what was going on? You know, mm. let me do my impersonation. So Okendo was like, oh! No, I, wanna, I, was just, I was just gonna ask you, what is your, what is your most? What the is- great town of Asia. <laughs> Our friends, the Chinese, <laughs> right? And remember, guys, this guys are going to be critical. They're going to be really critical in how we okay, think no, about Okay, okay, no, we're going <laughs> to... <laughs> okay, you know, no, we're going to bring you that. backstage afterwards. I hope you're still watching. <laughs> oh, you know, my and, God. Um, and it wasn't until he came back that we're like, ah, mm-hmm. I see. Mm-hmm. You know, and, um, and he's all... So kept that spirit in 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 the in the group in Harambe as a group, you know the fact that we need everybody, right? The focus is Africa, but we cannot ex- exclude people who want to help us, mm-hmm. and I think that's mm-hmm. important, you know. So as we look at America, as we hope that you know um, our brothers and sisters in the U.S. you know sort of find their 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 their, their footing, you know, as they as they make more demands you know, on society, on government, uh, we have to back them up, you know, mm. whether it's soft skills, mm-hmm. whether it's just appreciation, whether it's even the way we treat, which we treat our brothers, mm. you know, you know, um, and we had this argument, my, myself, my brother, a couple of friends are like, look, you know, on the record, <laughs> we don't have it as hard as African-American. Mm. We don't. You can come home. <laughs> That's different. You know, you could come, you could come home. You know, you could be in Nigeria, you could speak Pigeon. My guy, how far now? Nobody thinks it's funny. Mm. And you're in the majority. Mm. You know, so you know that attitude that Africans give, like, what 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 are you doing? Because of the civil right, we could come over to school. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you understand that? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. of the civil right, we could from Africa attend Harvard and go to MIT, and go to mm. UC Davis and Berkeley, because they walked, right? They and, crossed And a lot the of our presidents, a lot of our presidents were educated okay. in HBCUs yeah. in the absolutely, States. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, so the we, need to, we, need, we need to understand we're not in competition. We're, mm-hmm. we're you know, we're complementary, we're complementing each other. That's, that's, that's important. And, um, and this is our, this is our, this is our century. Right. Mm. This is where we rise. This is our decade. Uh, this is our decade. <laughs> this is where we rise, and this is where we say, you know, enough is enough. Uh, the mm-hmm. guys who are going into leadership need to go into leadership because it affects us all, right? Mm-hmm. The guys who are going into tech need to go into tech, and we need to help each other, you know, build. It's important. Think about think about the story of some of the greatest producers slash directors in Hollywood. They help themselves. George Lucas. Um, all one generation, Steven Spielberg, there are two other people that are missing, right? Mm. And there's a whole documentary on them. And they sort of helped each other, right? And it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like they were like, it wasn't like some destiny thing. I remember mm-hmm. um, um, 
Spielberg talking about Jaws and how the shark wouldn't even <laughs> wouldn't work. And as a result, they only had like maybe three or two shots of the shark in Jaws one, and we didn't know. Mm-hmm. They just showed you the fin and they did dun 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 dun, dun but you never saw the shark because the shark <laughs> didn't work. Right? And this guy has gone on to be probably the most successful director in Hollywood, right? Wow. Um, but he had, he had peers who sort of helped him along the way. We need to do that. And I think that's what Harambe symbolizes. And that that's what should be our mantra, you know, for um, as Africans, as Black people. So Obama gives you a blank check. What is, what is the first thing that you do to um, change the world? Do you do more of what you're already doing? Yes, I stay in my lane because that's mm-hmm. where you know, that's where I shine. Uh, Obama gives me a blank check. Um, I want to. I'm big on media. I'm big on perception. I'm big on telling our own stories, and I think it's important. Um, I think we're shaped a lot by the West, mm-hmm. and and that culture is Hollywood. Mm-hmm. What we wear, the music we listen to. I mean, there's trap music now in Nigeria. Do you understand what I mean? Like it's. <laughs> You get like okay. that, that. That's what I'm talking. Like it, it influences all of us. Yeah. The schools we go, the yeah. end zone, mm. the platforms we're on. Mm. You know. Um, so it's important that Africans have to also start thinking, you know, broadly that way. Uh, so I would stay in my lane. I would, you know, I would do more entertainment. I'll do media. You know, I'll do. You know, I'll explore ways by which you know we can tell the better versions of our story. Mm. Right. Um, and there's some ugly sides and you know that's important also but I don't think we do enough work telling our own stories and there's a lot of good in us a lot you know there's a lot there's a lot and a lot of good you know um, and that's what I would do with a black check anything you want to leave our viewers with Tay before we wrap up uh, well any, any lessons you've learned that have your secret sauce what's what's uh kept you going well, in this crazy time period. Yeah, I just want to say that um, that a lot of times that um, that life could be hard because everything that's thrown at us looks perfect, right? Mm-hmm. You get on LinkedIn and you see the girl who just graduated first class, best, best in her class, best in her entire, best GPA ever since 1977. I'm not sure if you see that. <laughs> like a whole trend right now. I'm like, wait, why are you telling us this? You know, and you see that and there's a tendency for young people to just feel like they're not good enough. Mm. Um, because it feels like everybody else looks amazing on Instagram. Mm. You know, everybody has an amazing relationship on Facebook. Like it's it's all these different things that are thrown at us. And I like to say that that's not the real world. You don't have to be perfect. And I think my life is that. Like I, like I, I told you, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I did everything. And that was my own motto, right? I don't know what I want to do. I'll do everything. I'll figure it out. So I did basketball. I did I did this. I played football. I, you know, I, um, I, I did that. Even with Harambe, right? I wasn't sure. I, you know, 2008 came, you know, no work. So I'm like, okay, what do I do? I just found something. I kept on doing it. But I made sure that was something that I was passionate about. Mm. Right? If you're passionate about something and you don't give up and you hold on and you commit to doing well, right, and um, and being the best that you can, you would have you would have an okay life. You'd be okay. You'd be fine. You mm. just you'd be just fine. You know. Um, and I think there's a lot of pressure right now by just you know um, the world that we live in. You know, don't try to be perfect. Just be passionate and be committed to that passion, and you'll be fine. You know, I hope that helps. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> I can't think of a better a, a better note to end on. Thank you so much, Larry, for joining me. This has been fun. There's gonna have to be a part two because there's a whole oh, other set of juicy questions that we didn't even get to. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> there's so much that. comedy we didn't get to, but this has been so fun. I appreciate you. Thank you, everybody who is watching. We appreciate you. Shout out to Okendo, shout out to Uzo, shout out to Ishmael. Thank you for watching. Um, Okendo, I'm going to send you a link. I hope you can join us backstage for a few minutes. (laughs) Okay. For those of you who have been watching and liking, we appreciate you so much. Share this video with at least two people. I know you had a good time. I know you learned a lot and you can bless somebody's life. Follow us on uh, Instagram at North Press. Subscribe to our YouTube page and our uh, like our Facebook page. Any place else you're not connected, make sure you stay connected because we have a lot of good stuff coming your way. All right. Stay blessed.
eat your greens, take your vitamin C, get your vitamin D. We love you. Peace.